It was about 6.30 p.m. when I finally pulled up to the old two-story house that has been in my family for four generations. It had been a very productive day in the field, and I felt like I had gotten a lot done. I was more than ready for a nice home-cooked dinner and a relaxing evening with Terry, my wife of 20 years. I'd done it all, I thought, as I rested from the day's work. Sure, working on the farm is hard, but the rewards more than make up for it. Plus, I had the best wife anyone could wish for. Terry was a wonderful girl, always so warm, friendly, and loving. Of course, she had her moments, as we all do, and sometimes she was a little too trusting and was a little silly at times, but she was my partner, my rock, and I wouldn't trade her for anything. As I entered the house, I immediately smelled freshly made meatloaf and knew I was in for a treat. Terry loved to cook, and she had a knack for making even the most mundane dish delicious. I glanced at the mail lying on the small table next to the door. Most of it was addressed to a tenant or resident, junk and announcements about this or that. A couple of letters were addressed to Bill and Terry Carson, my wife and me, and I realized they were the standard bills we always received at that time of the month. As I walked into the kitchen, I saw Terry pulling a hot meatloaf out of the oven, and I rushed over to help her. She thanked me for taking it, and I set it on the table. After that, I went to the bathroom on the second floor and washed my face. When I came back, the rest of dinner was waiting for us on the table. That smells so good, honey, I said as I sat down at the table. Nothing special, just meatloaf, she said. I added some hot chili peppers and mushrooms to it. I hope you like it. I'm sure I will, I told her. She put a portion on my plate and then piled on the mashed potatoes and mushroom gravy. I couldn't help myself, I looked at her and smiled. She definitely knew the way to my heart. She sat down and put some food on our plates. So, how was your day? I asked. She nodded, taking a bite of her food. Good, she said. Finally sold the Jennings old house. Terry had started working at a real estate office in town about 10 years ago. She wanted to contribute to the family after the twins were old enough to walk to and from the bus stop. Now, they were both gone. Dan, our son, had gotten an appointment to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, and Lisa, our daughter, was attending Washington University as a veterinarian. With Terry's job and the income from the farm, we lived quite well. Our goal was to retire at 60 and take a long cruise, maybe the Caribbean, we hadn't decided yet. I looked at Terry. So far, our life together had been great, but in the last couple of months, I noticed she'd become a little moody. Tonight, she was even more brooding than usual. Are you okay, honey? I asked. You seem a little preoccupied. I think we need to talk after dinner, she said quietly. Okay, I said. Maybe after we eat, we can go out on the back porch. That's where we usually went when we wanted to smoke and drink something for the adults. We'd agreed a long time ago not to smoke in the house. Sounds like a good idea, she said. We finished dinner, and I wondered what was bothering her. I helped her put everything away, then grabbed a beer and poured her a glass of wine. We went out to the backyard, and I offered her a cigarette, which she readily accepted. After lighting it, I sat on the porch swing, and she settled into a chair next to the bistro. So, what's on your mind? I asked. Bill, please promise me you'll listen to me all the way through, she said. I'm so torn and I'm afraid you're going to hate me when this is over. Please let me finish before you say anything, and promise me you won't be mad. Okay, I said. I'll listen. What's on your mind? Bill, you know I love you more than anything in the world, right? She asked. I started to get a little worried but encouraged her to continue. Of course, I said. You've put up with me and lived on this farm for 20 years, so that must mean something, right? I asked jokingly. She smiled, but the smile didn't last long. You know you're the only man I've been with my whole life, she said. And you're the only woman I've ever been with, I answered her. What does all this mean? You're starting to scare me. I guess I should just come out and say it, she said. I'm thinking about getting a lover before I get too old. We'll both be 40 in two years, and I'd like to know what it would be like to experience another man. Wait, what? 
I asked. You mean you want to have sex with another man, and you want me to just accept it? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying, she answered me. It doesn't affect you, and it doesn't have to change anything between us. I'll still love you as much as I do now, it's just that I want to experience it at least once in my life before I, you know, change. What? I'm not pleasing you enough? I ask. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. No, no, she said. You're a wonderful lover. I've just never had anything to compare you to. It's like driving a Ford pickup all your life and one day getting a chance to drive something else, like a sports sedan. Like I said, it doesn't mean anything and it shouldn't change anything between us. I don't think I like your comparison, I told her. For your information, it's already changed our relationship. I guess I didn't put it quite right, she said. Please don't misunderstand me. So, you've already done it? I ask. No, she replied. Have you decided who you want to do it with yet? I asked. No, not at all, she replied. It's just something I've been seriously thinking about lately. You didn't come up with it on your own. Who put that stupid idea in your head, Terry? I asked, trying to stay calm. I wanted to punch a hole in the wall, but I knew that would only push Terry further away. I needed to get more information, and I needed to make Terry smell the coffee. Well, Marie Cunningham, you know her. She works in my office, Terry said. We go out to lunch sometimes and stuff, and she told me that this is something I really need to do to assert myself, and she said if you really loved me, you'd let me do it. That's why I wanted to talk to you, she said. It wouldn't be cheating if I got your permission first. Did she? Marie Cunningham? Brunette, 5'9", five, fine, nothing special. She's in her 30s, dresses like a teenager. That Marie Cunningham? I asked. Yeah, Terry said. Do you know her? I've met a few times at your office, but I can't say I know her well personally, I said. From what I've heard, she's been divorced twice in the last six years, and she's working on a third divorce right now. I don't know about all that, Terry said, somewhat surprised. I know she's been divorced at least once. There's talk in cartwheel that she's been friends with a bunch of guys, I said. Her husband is pretty suspicious, and from what I hear, he's getting ready to file for divorce. I didn't know all that, Terry said. I decided to change tactics and try to make her realize what a serious mistake she was making. Tell me something, honey, I said. How long have we known each other? I don't know, she replied. About 30 years, maybe a little more. Say that, and we've been together since freshman year of high school, right? I asked. Yeah, something like that, she replied. In all that time, have you ever known me as someone who would agree to something like that? I asked her. She shook her head. Well, no, not really, she said. So what makes you think I'd agree to this now, after all these years? I asked. Well, Marie says. Terry started before I cut her off. Forget about Marie, I said. Maria is an idiot. I want to hear what you think. Let me put it to you this way, what would you do if I came home one day and said, hey, honey, you know I love you, but I really need to have sex with another woman to assert myself. Ha! Huh? Would you be okay with that? Oh, hell no, she said. I'd kick your ass. So why should it be any different now? I asked. She looked at me, shocked. Oh my god, she said. I never thought of that. Do you remember my grandparents? I asked. My grandparents died in 2001, a couple of years after their 80th wedding anniversary. They were just over 100 years old by then and were well known in the neighborhood. In 1999, at the nursing home where they lived, the family threw them the best anniversary party ever. Yes, I remember, she said. Do you remember their 80th birthday party? I asked. You and I talked about marriage then, remember? I remember, she said, with a smile. I know I already told you about it, but I'll say it again, just in case you forgot, I said. I asked Grandpa what the secret to their marriage was. 
he told me a story I will never forget. When they got married, a lot of people in these parts were still getting around on horses and baby carriages. This was in 1919, just after World War I. Grandpa told me that after the wedding, he put grandma in the baby carriage and drove out of the church. They drove a couple of miles down the road, and the horse fell off. That's one, grandpa said. He picked the horse up, and they rode further down the road. After a couple of miles, the horse fell again. That's two, grandpa said. They kept going, and about the time they were coming up to the house, the horse fell down again. That's three, grandpa said. He got out of the baby carriage, got a shotgun out of the trunk, and shot the horse dead as a doornail, over there as a matter of fact, I said, pointing to the driveway. Grandma, according to grandpa, wasn't too pleased and started expressing all sorts of hatred and displeasure. Grandpa said he just looked at her, smiled, and said, that's one. You know, I don't recall a single crossword between them and all the time I've known them, I said. I looked at Terry and saw her eyes widen with fear. You have two strikes against you now, I told her. The first is for listening to that asshole Maria in the first place. The second is for thinking that you think I'm going to go along with this stupid idea of yours, even if you haven't already. There will be those who say I should lead you on the road like Grandpa left the horse. You mean you'd really kill me, asked Terry, shocked. No, but it would be tempting, I said. The truth is, I still love you, even as stupid and gullible as you sometimes are, and I have many years invested in you. You think I'm stupid, she asked in a thin voice. Sometimes, I said. Remember that little incident with the sandwich? Terry used to make me lunch, and one day a few years ago, she made a sandwich for me, except she forgot to put anything on the bread. Imagine my surprise when I pulled out two clean slices of bread with nothing on them. When I got home that evening, she asked me if I enjoyed my lunch, and I told her it was great, but I had never had a jam sandwich before. She swore she'd made me a bologna and cheese sandwich and felt like an idiot when I told her I'd found two pieces of bread jam together. You're never going to let me relive that, are you, she asked, with a smile. No, I wouldn't let you, I told her, laughing. So, what are we doing now, she asked. That's up to you, I said. You're a smart girl. You've raised two good kids. You'll figure it out for yourself. I've never told you what to do before, and I'm not going to start now. Just know this, I will absolutely not be your cuckold, and I will not tolerate disrespect. Think of it this way, you are in the bottom of the ninth inning, and you have two strikes against you. What we do next depends on what you do now. If you don't mind, I have to get up early in the morning to get back to the North 40, so I'm going to go to bed. I put out my cigarette and headed upstairs. Epilogue, three months later, I stopped the combine, got out of it, and walked to my pickup. It was lunchtime, and I was looking forward to enjoying my meal in the comfort of the air-conditioned cab. However, when I got in the car, I realized that I had left my lunch at home. Oh crap, I thought. Now I'll have to spend at least half an hour to go back for it. I looked in the rearview mirror and saw a cloud of dust heading my way. Looking closer, I saw that it was Terry's SUV heading towards me. She stopped next to my car and got out of it. I noticed the tight jeans and smiled, even after all these years, she still looked good, and I loved looking at her taut legs. She walked over to me and kissed me with her mouth open. Hey cowboy, she said, you left your lunch at the house, so I thought I'd bring it to you. Well, thanks, I said. I was just on my way back to pick it up. Mind if I join you, she asked. Not at all, I answered her. She opened the side door of her SUV and we climbed into the back seat where she had a picnic lunch stashed. As we ate, I thought back to the previous three months. After our conversations, she told Marie to stick her idea in her ear. Shortly afterward, Marie's husband caught her engaging in lewd behavior with one of her many boyfriends and filed divorce papers so fast it made her head spin. The day after our little talk, Terry apologized to me, first with words, hugs, and kisses, then with an impressive dinner, and finally with a scalding hot strip tease and a wild night of mind-blowing sex. I know some will say that I should have kicked her ass for not even thinking about the ideas that Marie had put in her head, but the thing is, I just can't give up on a love like that that has lasted over two decades. Things might have been different if she had actually acted on her desires, 
But she didn't, and the truth is, I don't care at all about other people's opinions. This is my life and my marriage, and I know I would be miserable without her. It would be like cutting off an arm or a leg. Terry worked for a real estate company for a couple of months and sold several properties that brought her a nice commission. After analyzing our finances, she realized that we had enough money in all of our accounts to live comfortably in retirement if we chose, so she quit her job and became a stay-at-home wife. Sometimes she even spent days with me in the field. I have to admit, I liked having her with me. After we ate, she pulled out a jar of whipped cream. This is for our dessert, she said, with a sly smile. I looked in the basket but couldn't find anything to put them on. So what's for dessert? I asked. I don't see anything in the basket. She pulled off her short t-shirt, exposing her bare breasts. Here it is, she said. If you want to. Damn it, I said, smiling. I always knew you were the best cook around, and here you're just top-notch. Now give me a can of whipped cream. Don't forget to hit that like button if you enjoyed this video, and if you're curious to see where this journey takes us next, make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss a single update. Your support is what keeps this channel alive and kicking, and every like, comment, and share means the world to us. We've got plenty more stories, insights, and surprises coming your way, so stay tuned for the next video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.